Good morning. We're going to keep talking about the Z-transform, but this time we're going to talk about the inverse Z-transform. Um, there's more than one way of doing this. We're only going to look at one in the class, and that's doing the inverse by partial fraction expansion. Um, we know some transforms already, and when we looked at the Z-transforms, for example, if x of n is a to the n mu n, where mu n is the step function, we know its transform is 1 over 1 minus a z to the minus 1, or z over z minus a, and its region of convergence is going to be the magnitude of z is greater than the magnitude of a. So we can use that to find inverse z transforms. We know that every time we get a term like this, we know that we're going to get an x of n and of this case. So let's look at these, uh, let's look at how to do it uh, with examples. Let's take, for example, let's take, for example, um, this x of n, and they tell us we want to find the inverse z transform. Um, in this case, we're going to start out with single poles that don't repeat. Um, they give it to us in this form because this is the typical form that we have in x of n. We can work in this way. I prefer to work with positive values of z, or z, z to the positive powers. So I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by z squared and get something like this. We look at the denominator, we can factor it, and we see it has two factors, right? It has two poles, pole at z equal to 2, and a pole at z equal to 1. Now we're going to do the partial fraction expansion. Um, before, or maybe before, when you were doing the inverse Laplace transforms, generally the denominator had a higher polynomial power than the numerator. In this case, that's not going to be always the case. For example, we have z squared both in the numerator and the denominator. Because of that, we have this, we have this constant term, a of 0, in our partial fraction expansions. Um, we find it this way. For example, we solve for a0. <clears throat> if we simply set z equal to 0, these two terms are going to go equal to 0. And so a of 0 is simply x of z evaluated at z equal to 0. And when we look at this term, if z we set z equal to 0, we see by inspection that we get ah, 1 half. Um, we find a1 and a2 tip by the same way we do all partial fraction expansions. And so we take a1, we multiply by the cofactor of a1, evaluate it at the pole, z equal to 2. So we're going to get this, and we see that a of 1 is equal to 9 halves. We do the same thing with a2, right? Multiply by z to the minus 1, divide by z, and evaluate at the pole, z equal to 1. And then we see that a2 is going to be negative 4. So after our partial fraction expansion, we see that x of z is this here. Now, 1 half, we know that its inverse is going to be 1 half delta n. Uh, this was one of the problems that you did for homework. Now, z over z minus 2 has two possible inverses depending on the region of convergence. Now, we see that the region of convergence is z greater than 2, <clears throat> so we know that the inverse is going to be 2 to the n mu n. It's going to be multiplied by 9 halves because that's the constant. Here the minus 4 goes down and the same thing here. Since the region of convergence is greater than the pole, we get the inverse is 1 to the n mu n. Now in the case that we have repeated poles, we have to, we have an additional term. Um, this inverse, we're, I'm just going to give it to you for the moment. Later on we'll actually calculate it in class. So if we have a to the minus, a to the z to the minus 1, and 1 times a, z to the minus 1 squared, or a to the z, z minus a squared, the inverse of this, as long as z is greater than a, is going to be this term here. So let's look at this through an example again. And let's say we have this example here. Let me multiply numerator and denominator by z cubed just to get all the powers positive, and we'll get z cubed over this here. We have our constant term plus three terms now. We have one term for z minus one, but z minus one half squared is gonna give us two terms. One term squared, and one term that's just elevated to the 
to the first power. Um, we solve for them as for a0, a1, and a3, the same as we did before. a3, I'm sorry about that. a3 should be 2 and a4 should be 2. I mean a4 should be 2. We get that z a of 0 is equal to 0. a of 1, solving for a1, we multiply by z to the minus 1 over z. We evaluated z equal to 1, and we find that a1 is equal to 4. Here we have a2. Uh, I'm sorry, I wrote a3 up here, but it really should be a2. We solve for a2, again, multiplying by z minus 1 half squared, dividing by z, and evaluating at z equal to 1 half, and we see that we get negative 1 half. Now, to evaluate for a4, what I wrote down here is a3. We can't just multiply by z minus 1 half and divide by z because that would leave a term here at a3. So what we have to do is we have to take the, the derivative before we evaluate. And so we take x of z and multiply by z minus 1 half squared divide by z. And we take the derivative. So we take this term here, we take the derivative with respect to z and later on evaluate at z equal to 1 half. After doing that, we see that a3 then is equal to negative 3. Um, so our partial fraction expansion is going to be this here. We have three terms, z minus 1, z minus 1 half squared, and z minus 1 half, where our region of convergence is greater z, the magnitude of z, greater than 1. Now, we know that each of these terms has two possible inverses depending on the region of convergence. Now, I didn't do this for the last problem, but let me, let me look at this in a little more detail than this problem. Each of these terms is going to have two possible regions of convergence. Right? For example, z over z minus 1, this term here, the region of convergence can e either be magnitude of z greater than 1 or less than 1. Now, the intersection of all the regions of convergence, or the region of convergence of each term, has to give magnitude of z greater than 1. So we look at the region of convergence of each term, right? This has two regions of convergence, greater than 1 half or less than 1 half. The same thing for the last term. And so we have three terms where the intersection of all the different regions of convergence has to equal magnitude of z greater than 1. Now there's no ambiguity and there's never going to be am any ambiguity here. We see that it has to be the magnitude of z greater than 1 and 1 half for each case. Right? If we took any of the other terms here, we wouldn't get this as the intersection. And once we know that for each of the terms, the region of convergence is going to be greater than the pole, then we can get, by inspection, the inverse transform for each of these terms. Right? The first one is just going to be 4 mu of n. This one is going to be, as, as I had written above, n, a to the n mu of n, and this is minus 3, 1 half n mu of n. Now let's look at the case where we have complex poles. And as I wrote here, this is really case 1 because the a in case 1, there's really no, no limitation. It could be a complex number. But let's look at this. Let's at least do an example of this. Let's say we're given this x of z. We multiply, let me multiply numerator and denominator by z squared to write this in positive values of z. And when we factor the denominator, we see that we get complex poles. Right? We have a pole at 1 plus j2, and we have another pole at 1 minus j2. So we do our partial fraction expansion. We look for a0, a1, and a2 exactly as we did before. The only difference is that now we're working with complex numbers. For example, a1, we multiply by the denominator, well, di divide by z, and evaluate at the pole z equal to 1 plus j2. And when we do that, we see that we get 1 minus j to the 1 fourth. Now, I'm going to write this number in polar form just because it's going to be convenient later on. And I do the same thing for a2. Now, our cases are going to be real systems. 
So we're always going to have complex conjugate poles. If the poles are complex conjugate, the constants that, that go with them are also going to be complex conjugates. In this case, I actually wrote it out, but we see that the constant for A2 is going to be 1 plus J1 fourth, which is the complex conjugate of A1. So these two numbers are always going to be complex conjugates. Now, writing that as our partial fraction expansion, we get this. Now, taking the inverse Z transform, since the magnitude is greater than the pole, we know what the inverse is going to be. It's, right, it's going to be A to the N times mu N, in it, where in this case A is um, 1 plus J2. The same thing over here. And so this would be our X of N. Now, of course, this is our X of N, but it has complex numbers. We know that our systems are real, so we know that the complex terms are going to cancel out. And if we work through the math, right, this is in polar form. Let me write this in polar form too. 1 plus j2 is right square root of 5 e to the j1.1. Same thing here. And so we see that these numbers are complex conjugates one of the other. Working through the math, right, they both have the same magnitudes. And the phases, are going. To, one is going to be the negative of the other one. And so let's factor out everything that they have in common. Both have a 1.031 and a square root of 5 to the n, the same. The other terms, let's write together. Let's also factor out the, the step function. So taking these two terms, we have something here. Taking this term and this term, we can write it as this. Now, since these have the same exponent except for a negative, we can write this using Euler's equation as 2 cosine 1.1n minus 0.245. Um, taking the 2 out, we get, we get finally, for the final answer, we get this. So we get 2.062 square root of 5 to the n cosine 1.1n minus 0.245 mu to the n. In other words, when we have complex poles, in, in frequency we have complex pole. In time, we're going to have a signal that oscillates. Let's do one more example before stopping. Now, in this case, they're going to give us x of z, but they're not going to give us the region of convergence. Instead, they're going to tell us determine the inverse for all possible regions of convergence. And so we do our partial fraction expansion as we did before, right? This is the same problem as above. So I'm just going to write down what it was, the partial fraction expansion. Now, we need to find all possible regions of convergence, which means we have to find the regions of convergence of each one and take the different intersections. For example, the first term is 1 half. <clears throat> now, the inverse of 1 half is going to be 1 half delta to the n, and it doesn't matter what z is, right? This has no restrictions on z, so the region of convergence is going to be all the whole complex plane. However, the second term, z over z minus 2, has two possible regions of convergence, right? It has a pole is equal to 2, so the region of convergence is magnitude of z greater than 2 or less than 2. The final term here, z over z minus 1, has a pole at 1, at z equal to 1. So the region of convergence, again, is going to be magnitude of z greater than 1 or magnitude of z less than 1. Now we need to take all possible combinations of these regions of convergence. Right? We have, we have two terms, each has two regions of convergence, and so we're going to have four possible regions of convergence. <coughs> z greater than 2 and greater than 1, z greater than 2 and less than 1, less than 2 and greater than 1, and less than 2 and less than 1. We take the intersection, of course the intersection z can't be greater than 2 and less than 1 at the same time, so here we get the empty set, so this one is, doesn't count. But the other three are three valid regions of convergence, right? If we take the intersection here, we get the magnitude of z greater than 2. Here, when we take the intersection, we get the magnitude of z between 1 and 2. And here, we get it, the magnitude of z less than 1. <clears throat>
And now we want to see what the inverse is for each of those regions of convergence. For example, if the magnitude of z is greater than 2, what would the inverse be? Well, this term is always going to be 1 half delta to the n. Now the second term, this term here, if the magnitude is greater than the magnitude of z greater than 2, the inverse is just going to be a to the n mu to the n. And so it's going to be 9 halves 2 to the n times mu to the n. In the, in the last term, or for the last term, the constant is minus 4, and so we put the minus 4 there. In the inverse of z over z minus 1, since the region of convergence is greater than 1, the inverse is just going to be mu to the n. Now, for the case that the region of convergence is between 1 and 2, in this case the region of convergence is going to be less than the pole, and for the last term the region of convergence is going to be greater than the pole. So for this term is going to be the same, since for the last term it's greater than the pole. But here the region of convergence is less than 2. So the, re the inverse is not this. It's going to be right minus a to the n mu to the minus n minus 1. And in the final case, where the region of convergence is z less than 1, the first term stays the same. This one stays the same as it was before, because the region of convergence is again less than 2. But the last term <clears throat> is going to change. Right, again, the last term is going to be minus a to the n term times mu to the minus n minus 1, and so we get this term here. Again, some homework problems for you to work on. This is in the, in the syllabus, but here are some homework problems for you to work on looking at inverse z-transforms.